Jared, thank you for leading that song, I'll Be a Friend to Jesus. Uh, I think it works very well with what my thoughts are this morning. We'll be taking our, uh, my talk from Hebrews chapter 12, the first three verses. If you care to read with me, we will read together uh, those thoughts. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. I thank you for being here this morning. I pray that our time together encourages you and helps us to focus upon Jesus, our Savior. Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Can we pray before we begin our talk? Dear God in heaven, we praise you for this time this morning. We praise you for uh, the love of your son Jesus, that he was willing to die on a cross for us. We praise you for calling us together to remember his death as we partake of the Lord's Supper, to remember his pain, to remember his life, to remember his being raised from the dead and the promise and the hope that comes through the life of your son Jesus and his death on the cross. We thank you for the grace and the mercies we see every day. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. In this verse, we see that uh, the writer tells us we, are, we, we find a great cloud of witnesses that surround us on our journey in this life. And he's encouraging us to look to Jesus, who endured the cross for the joy that was set before him, and he despised the shame. When he talks about this great cloud of witnesses, you already probably know, he's talking about those, what I call the hall of faith or heroes of faith <clears throat> in chapter 11. How they acted in faith despite all of the forces of evil arrayed against them. They listened to God's voice and uh, they did what God asked of them. They went places they didn't know anything about. They led God's people in hard times. They fought in battles. They suffered mockings and floggings and chains and imprisonment, stonings. They were destitute, afflicted, mistreated, and were killed for their faith. Yet, as the writer tells us, they didn't receive what was promised because God has provided something better and that is for us to enjoy. And these heroes are witnesses that surround us. These witnesses, uh, Paul, uh, well, writer, sorry. I used to believe it was Paul. I didn't mean that now. Um, the writer tells us that it's like running a race and I don't know if any of you ever have been in a, ran track and field in school. I did. Wasn't very good at it, but I enjoyed it. Um, and there's a, usually there's actually some stands, and there's some people in the stands. And they're usually cheering people on, especially at the college level and so on. And they're cheering them on to do well, to persevere to endure, to win the race. And the writer of Hebrews is using that same idea. And, but he's using it for us. These witnesses are cheering us on as we run this race. And they're doing so to remind us of the promise. Don't give up is what they're saying. Remember the promise. Remember the, the people that came before you. Remember what they endured. The promise they didn't receive, but that we have now. The hope we have now. 
The witnesses are telling us, look what we have now set before us. The writer of Hebrews goes on and encourages us to look around at these witnesses. And then as we look around at the witnesses, he says, lay aside every weight and sin and throw everything off that hinders and the sin that easily entangles us. Interesting idea. We're running a race. Have you ever tried to run a race with perseverance and at the same time have weights? Can you, those of you who like to do jogging or running, maybe even riding bikes, can you imagine doing so with weights on your ankles or your arms? Can you imagine doing so with, a, as we say, a box of rocks on your shoulder? That's what he's talking about. And those are things that hinder us, that entangle us. And if you think of a runner, imagining something entangling your feet, Maybe like a dog that likes to, you know, walk between your legs and you're trying to run and the dog is entangling you. And it's, it's hard to do that. So, um, I, I can't imagine when I was in high school, the coach saying, Herb, listen, Herb, you're going to have to wear these race, weights when you run today. And I'd go say, what? And the coach would say, yes, you'll be running with these things that entangle you and your feet. And I'm thinking, that doesn't sound like that makes sense. That's not very easy to do. It doesn't feel like it's the best way to run a race, especially if we're going to persevere and if we're going to run with endurance. We're going to keep it up. We're not going to run. It's not, it's not a 100-yard dash. I never ran the 100-yard dash, but it's not a 100-yard dash. It's a long race, one of endurance and perseverance. And those things that hinder us discourage us. So we might ask the writer, so how do we throw these things off? How do we lay them aside, as it says in some versions? <clears throat> well, he answers the questions by looking to Jesus, the founder, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith, who went before us. Jesus went before us and endured the cross for us. He died a very cruel death for us. He suffered and he paid our debt for us. And then it says, the writer says, he scorned the shame of the cross for us, for me. The writer says Jesus experienced shame. I don't, I don't know if I've ever realized that until the last few years of my life, that Jesus experienced shame. I think everybody here and everybody watching and listening has probably experienced shame. Now, I want to be clear, it's not shame because of guilt. For us it is, but for Jesus it wasn't guilt. He wasn't guilty of anything. I just want to be, set the record straight. Jesus was guiltless and sinless, but he did experience the shame. It says he despised it, he scorned it. So I found something interesting that was said by David McClister. I'd like to, to read it. I think it's helpful. While Roman crucifixion is certainly one of the most excruciating ways to die ever invented, it was designed not only to be painful, but humiliating, to be full of shame. The point was death, yes, but also to brand the victims with a lasting stigma so that the last thing you remember is this shameful way that person died. We often focus on the pain Jesus endured. Yes, that's appropriate. Perhaps we don't appreciate enough the shame that was associated with the story of the gospel and how difficult it was in the ancient world to proclaim a message about a man who died on, as a social reject? Because that's how Jesus would have been viewed. He would have been as reject, viewed as rejected by society, a social reject. At that point, Christians were associated with a story of shame. 
It was not an honorable thing in the eyes of the first century society to be a Christian. Your Savior is who? And he died how? That would have been a shameful thing to, to tell some who don't understand. Jesus experienced the shame of the cross, but he scorned it and he despised it. It had no power of G over Jesus. Of course, I know now, and you perhaps know, that evil is the source of shame. And Jesus knew that. He was well aware of that, being divine. Yet Jesus didn't allow that shame that he had to experience to keep him from his appointed death on the cross. He knew it was coming. He, he understood completely what was going to happen, I believe. But yet... He went forward. <clears throat> Jesus took what the world saw as shameful and changed it to an act of love for all mankind, not just for the people of his day. He endured the cross and the shame because of the joy set before him. He was looking ahead at the joy before him, the joy of redeeming us from our sins. Jesus wants us to come together this morning, as we are doing, as witnesses together to encourage us to come back to the cross every first day of the week. Not because we have it all together. Not because we've got this. We know how to deal with sin. We've overcome sin. No problem. Jesus died. I'm fine. Nothing to worry about. No. Not because we're so good and not because we're so strong. Jesus wants us to come back to the cross together as witnesses this morning to bring our burdens to him, to lay them aside at the cross every day if you need to, but certainly today, to throw off the burdens today because he understands our shame. He gets it. He's experienced it. He understands our burdens. He was nailed to a cross. He understands what it's like to try and run a race with weights and sins entangling us, a race where the goal is heaven. He understands that. He offers freedom from our burdens. He offers us his pain on the cross as a reminder of the joy set before us. He knows we also despise the shame. But sometimes we don't know what to do about the shame. He knows we have burdens, and we feel guilty, and he knows that evil whispers in our ear, don't share these sins, don't share these burdens with anyone else, don't tell anyone, keep it a secret. Because evil knows the best way to control us is for us to hide the burdens and to stay in the darkness. But Jesus brought the shame he experienced to light for all the world to see. He was lifted up on a cross. He didn't hide anything. And by doing so, he overcame it and set himself free and offers us freedom as well. The writer of Hebrews reminds us of the cloud of witnesses that have gone before us and the pain they endured. And God wants us to be witness to, witnesses together as we come together and as we remember the cross that Jesus died on. In fact, Paul talks about it a little bit. We have a memorial. It's a verse you've, you've read often. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, just as a reminder, just before he was, he was killed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whatever you, whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you hear what he said, he said, This is my body. I'm giving my body for you. And, of course, I believe there's symbolism that we become part of the body. 
But he's giving my body, he says, sorry, my lips are dry, and my blood for you. I'm giving you what I have to give you. And do this to remember my death until I come again. Paul tells us to come together to remember what Jesus did just before he was crucified. On the night he was betrayed, he told his disciples he was offering his body and his blood for us. Paul reminds us we can best remember what Jesus did to bring salvation by coming together today as witnesses together and examine ourselves and consider the body and the blood of Jesus as we eat this bread and we drink this fruit of the vine, the love that came from Jesus.